just a picture of his condescension. How low, right? How low the Lord of glory stooped to save sinners. Now, in verse 2, we see early in the morning. He's wasting no time. Wasting no time. He's about his father's business. He is diligent. He's earnest. This demonstrates his servant's heart. But early in the morning, he rose. He came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Just the power of his teaching here draws a crowd. It doesn't mention here that he performed any miracles. He simply went into the temple and taught. And the people, again, listening to the Lord Jesus Christ preach as no one else could and no one else ever has, one speaking with authority, not the words of a mere man, but direct revelation from Almighty God. Jesus is preaching and the people just gather to him. His teaching draws a crowd. And the Lord, again, in his condescension, just graciously teaches them. He sits in the temple and teaches them. That morning, though, as he's teaching in the temple, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman to him. They brought a woman to him and interrupt his teaching. And we see in verses 3 through 5, the accused, the accused. Verse 3 says this, Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? So now the issue before him in the temple now is an issue of the law. They bring before him an issue of the law. The woman stands accused in the midst of her accusers. The emphasis here in verses 3 through 5 is that she was caught in the very act. The word is katalambano for you Greek guys. It means seized, laid a hold of. She was literally seized in the very act. That means in conjunction with their law, their judicial process, that they had the witnesses necessary to put her to death. She was seized in the act. The Jews at this time, very judicious. We, we read the scriptures. Sometimes we miss this. They were very judicious about their legal procedure, very precise. Contrary to what we see at the kangaroo court where Christ was tried, ordinarily, aside from that, they were very judicious about their legal procedure. And so to put someone to death, the burden of proof was very high. From extra biblical writings in the first century, we know that the, the, two, the witnesses, the two or three witnesses, must have been eyewitnesses to the very act. They couldn't disagree at all on their testimony, and they had to explain things exactly the same and witness the act itself in order for them to put her to death. There's an account in an apocryphal book, Susanna, about a woman who was falsely accused of adultery. And she was acquitted of the adultery because the two witnesses in the case couldn't agree on the kind of tree that the act was said to have taken place under. So that was the burden of proof that was necessary for those witnesses in order to put this woman to death, okay? And there's no law, there's no doubt what the law says about this act. No doubt what the law says about this sin. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10, listen to this. The man who commits adultery with another man's wife He who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That's in Leviticus. That's the law of God. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22. If a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall put away the evil from Israel. So now in reference to verse 5, that Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned, neither passage actually mentions that the woman should be stoned to death, right? But in Deuteronomy chapter 22, the very next verse, chapter 23, or verse 23, it actually says that an adulteress who's betrothed or engaged to a man, if she's caught in adultery, should be stoned to death. But ordinarily, when death is prescribed for sin in the Bible, it usually involves stoning. That's confirmed for us by the prophets. Often that meant take them out and stone them to death. So it's not a stretch what's being said here by the Pharisees. Now, considering all of that, we have an issue, a problem of law. We know what the woman has done. The Pharisees have brought her in. She stands accused in the midst of her accusers. And we know what the law of God clearly says is the punishment or the penalty for this sin. What might be, from our reading, what might be an obvious question you might ask at this point? 
Where's the man? Where's the man? Where's he? They brought the woman forward. She's standing there accused. Where's the guy? Adultery takes two here. And if they were caught in the act, okay, if they were caught in the act, these witnesses witnessed the act and they caught, they seized, they laid hold of her. And where is the man? Asking that question of our setting here begins to pull on a thread, so to speak, that is going to uncover great wickedness on the part of these Pharisees, on the part of these scribes. It is a great travesty what they're doing here. They witness the act, and yet they did not bring the man in her, in there with her according to the law of God. The law of God clearly says this. Now, at the very least, think about it for a moment. At the very least, they let the guy go, and he abandons her to die. At the very least, that's what happened. At the very worst, it was a setup. And they wanted to entrap this woman, and the man was in on it. Either way, either way, it shows contempt for the woman. It shows contempt for the law of God. And here they are in the temple showing contempt for the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It's a hypocritical double standard. And listen, that's not all. They actually do this. They use the law of God, they use this woman to entrap Christ. They do this in order to entrap him. She wasn't the only one accused. Here, Jesus Christ, in their eyes, stands accused. Verse 6 says they were there to test him that they might have something in which to accuse him. Now, showing great contempt for the woman, they actually attempted to use the law of God as a weapon against the lawgiver. Now in verse 5, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say, Jesus, these Pharisees and scribes ask? The you there in the emphatic position. In other words, it's you. Hey, you. What are you going to say about it, right? Remember, the scribes and the Pharisees hated the Lord Jesus Christ, but they also hated these people, called them accursed, called them uneducated people of the land. So they were incensed. They were angry, hostile, that the Lord Jesus Christ actually saw these people not as contemptible, but as objects of his compassion, objects of his mercy, objects of forgiveness. They were incensed that he would just forgive their sins. Angry that the people would listen to him. Angry that the people would flock around him. Coming for mercy. Coming for grace, right? He eats with tax collectors and sinners. I want you to see an example of this. There's a contrast here between the, the attitude of the scribes and Pharisees and the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ that is being set up. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. Let me give you an, uh, uh, an example here of this contrast. Luke chapter 7, and drop down to verse 36. Here we have an example of the Lord Jesus Christ being invited to a Pharisee's house. And I think this just depicts the, the difference in attitude really, really well. Look at verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. Now, he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Now, from this story, we know that this Pharisee is not sympathetic to Jesus here. He's not sympathizing with him and asking. He's not coming to him like Nicodemus came to him. Uh, it, most likely, this Pharisee is probably trying to trap him too, trap him in his words. He's going to show contempt to the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? So he went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. Verse 37, and behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, meaning there that she's a prostitute, She's a prostitute. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster, alabaster flask of fragrant oil. And she stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now notice this. This is no hard-hearted, prideful self-righteous, wicked Pharisee. Now, this woman is repentant. Now, she's mourning. Why is she mourning? Mourning over her sin. She has come to realize her condition before God and she is there weeping before the Lord wanting to be cleansed 
wanting to be forgiven. She's seeking the Lord of glory for mercy. She wanted forgiveness. She wanted to be right with God. This woman knew, using the Pharisee's words, she knew what manner of woman she was, and she wanted to be changed. But in great contrast to Christ, who shows compassion to her, look at the attitude of the Pharisee, Simon. Verse 39. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now look at the contempt. Do you see that? Absolutely no mercy. She is an an object of derision, an object of shame. Don't let her even touch you. Don't touch her. She's unclean. Just showing contempt for this woman. And Simon spoke to himself. If Jesus were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman who is touching him. So now Jesus, being more than simply a prophet, reads his mind. <laughs> reads his thoughts, and Jesus answers him. Verse 40. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. One denarius was about a day's wage, a full day's wage. So we're talking about a lot of money here. Verse 42, and when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Now tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? So Simon, the Pharisee, answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged Verse 44, then he turned to the woman and he turned to the woman and he said to Simon the Pharisee, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. Now, Simon, by not washing his feet or not having his feet washed, this is a great insult. He showed contempt for the Lord Jesus Christ by not having his feet washed when he came into his house. This was a great insult. Look at verse 45. You gave me no kiss. It was as if the Lord Jesus Christ stepped through the front door of Simon the Pharisee's house and he's like, yeah, just sit over there. No greeting, no, no customary kiss, no washing of the feet. He showed contempt for the Lord Jesus Christ. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Therefore, the better translation of Hati there, so that she loved much. Her sins are forgiven, and she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this? Who is this guy who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So Simon the Pharisee, Simon the Pharisee sternly rebuked publicly right at his own dinner. Jesus once again, once again, shows grace and mercy and compassion to the notorious sinner And the Jews just continue to hate him, right? They hate him for it. And they want to entrap him. And they order, they want to, they want to kill him. So back to John chapter 8. It's an example of the contempt that they have for Christ. So in our account here, we see the woman in John chapter 8 now accused. She's standing in the midst of her accusers. But also we see in the story, Jesus stands accused in their eyes, accused by the Pharisees. And lastly, these wicked scribes and Pharisees stand accused, and they stand guilty, and we're going to see that. This is another wicked plot by these ungodly hypocrites. They treat the woman with contempt, and they accuse her. They treat the people with a contempt, and they accuse them. They treat the Lord Jesus Christ with contempt, and they accuse him. They treat God's law with contempt, and they use it as a tool for accusation. They want to trap Jesus and kill him, so they bring forward a woman to kill her. They spew lies and blasphemies. Who do these Pharisees sound like? Satan. They sound like Satan. 
And in just a few more verses, Jesus Christ, their Lord and eventual judge, will accuse them and judge them with a righteous judgment. Chapter 8, verse 44 says, listen, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Wow, it's a powerful statement. Just a few verses from now, they're going to stand accused. I want to give you an example of this notion or idea. The Pharisees are there accusing, like the accuser. They're breathing threats and malice and murder like the accuser. They spew lies and blasphemies like the accuser. Do you think that Satan is present in all this? Absolutely he is. Turn back with me to Zechariah. Zechariah, we're spending a little bit of time here today. Zechariah chapter 3. Just before your New Testament, Zechariah chapter 3. And look at verse 1 with me. This is at a time when the people are coming back into the land after exile. Right? So they're coming back into the land. And you have in this account Joshua, the high priest, who stands before the angel of the Lord as a representative of the people. And look what happens. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan the accuser, Satan, the adversary, standing at his right hand to oppose him. Now, Joshua is the high priest of the restoration. People are coming back to the land, and he represents the people here. Who does he have standing next to him? Satan, the adversary. And what is Satan doing? Satan is accusing him. He stands next to Joshua, the high priest, in front of the angel of the Lord and proclaims or spews accusations against the people before God. That's what Satan does. He stands next to you, so to speak, before God and accuses you, the accuser of the brethren. Look at verse 2. And the Lord, that's speaking of the angel of the Lord, said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. Now that, they're the angel of the Lord. The Lord is a claim of deity. The angel of the Lord is often in the Old Testament a Christophany. Uh, The angel of the Lord is often a pre-New Testament appearance of Christ, as it is here. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. If you're in Christ, you have been chosen by God. If you're in Christ, you've been chosen as a vessel for honor, cleansed and forgiven, sanctified and purified, and one day glorified for his praise and worship. You are a chosen brand, so to speak. Chosen Jerusalem. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? In other words, plucked out of judgment, plucked out of exile? Now Joshua, verse 3, was clothed with filthy garments, and he was standing before the angel. This pictures our sinfulness, doesn't it? Apart from Christ, we all stand in our filthiness, in our filth. The word here is the same word used in Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, when God says that all of our righteousness is as a filthy rag to him. It means a, it means a cloth used to clean up a menstrual discharge. It's just a filthy thing, considered unclean. Verse 4, he's standing there in these filthy garments before the angel of the Lord. Look at verse 4. Then he answered, and he spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. This is justification, amen? We have our sin removed, cleansed from our sin, forgiven. His wrath propitiated. Our sin is taken away forever. And we have his righteousness clothed in his righteousness, given to us, imputed to us. It's a glorious blessing. This is justification. Look at verse 5. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him. And the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house, likewise have charge of my courts. 
I will give you places to walk among these who stand here. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. The bride of Christ is a wondrous sign sign of God's forgiveness, of God's grace, of God's mercy. They are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. Using my servant, very common in the prophets to refer to Christ, the branch, another name for Christ. Verse 9, for behold, the stone, another name for Christ that I've laid before Joshua. Upon the stone are seven eyes, speaking of his omniscience, his infinite wisdom behold i will engrave its inscription says the lord of hosts and i will remove the iniquity of the land in one day and that day says the lord of hosts everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree man all satan can do is accuse all satan can do is flap his jaws in your ear right and if salvation were conditional upon our own works, upon our own righteousness, and he'd have something to accuse us of, wouldn't he? But praise be to God that it's not. Praise be to God that it's not your work, not your righteousness, all the things that you do. It is all of Christ. God is the one who justifies. So back in John chapter 8 now, the scribes and Pharisees are playing the part of Satan. They are satanically charged, satanically empowered, empowered and they're satanically here accusing genuine christians listen genuine christians don't act like this they don't act like these pharisees they don't act like the scribes if you acted as they did with contempt in your heart and you stand accused and guilty just like them then you'd be like them other so-called christians often accuse their brothers They sow divisiveness, division, discord, slander, their wickedness. And they do that with contempt for for the Lord's people, contempt for his church. It's an obvious contempt for the people of God. Have you ever seen someone share the gospel with contempt like that? Out for nothing other than to win the fight, right? Win the argument and expose them in their sin with no mercy, No offer of forgiveness, no grace from God? I've seen it. The most notable example, if you have watched the news in recent years, is the the crew at Westboro Baptist. That's just a, a notable example because they're in the news. You see that. That's showing contempt for sinners. You don't see the Lord Jesus Christ doing that. You see the wicked Pharisees doing that, don't you? We can't stand for any of that. You have to call it out where you see it divisiveness, slander, discord, backbiting, tail-bearing, wicked accusations. When people do that, they're acting like Satan. And we must take a stand against wickedness. You know, today, we we consider our, our times, our culture today, we see abortion just running rampant. It is mind boggling. The devastation that abortion has caused in our country or homosexuality now with the the decisions of the Supreme Court and everything that's going on, we have to stand and preach Christ in that context. We have to stand and we have to preach the judgment of God that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But you have to do that with compassion, with love, with the, the desire to see them saved with the desire, the pleading of your heart to, sh- to see God show them mercy and grace. Adultery is a terrible sin here, back in John chapter 7, John chapter 8. Adultery is a terrible sin. It's a, it's a devastating sin. It has broken families. It's caused divorce. It's led to abortion. Adultery is a devastating sin. It has led to terrible evil. But make no mistake about it. The self-righteous hypocritical slander of the wicked is an abominable evil before God. It's an abomination to God. It's going to lead these here to murder their Messiah in just six short months. That self-righteousness, that pride, that contempt that can flow out of the human heart, right? This, is, this, this exposes our depravity, doesn't it? It expo- exposes what is potential in the human heart, the depravity of our hearts. Here we see it oozing out of these wicked Pharisees. 
So essentially now, so far, we've uncovered the plot of these wicked Pharisees. And what did that plot entail? They wanted to bring forth this woman and thrust the Lord Jesus Christ upon the horns of a dilemma and trap him in his words for the purpose of killing him, for the purpose of murdering him. So what exactly was the dilemma? The dilemma we see in verse 6. Verse 6 says, This they said, these things they said, What do you say, Lord, about the law and this woman? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now, the purpose for their questioning him wasn't because they were confused, right? They didn't come perplexed and wanting his advice. We don't know what to do. Let's go to Jesus for advice. That wasn't why they came, right? That's not what they were there for. The purpose wasn't to entrap him and to ensnare him with the law. They knew, they knew that he was compassionate. They knew that he showed mercy to sinners, that he forgave sinners. Multiple times they complained that he received them, that he ate with them. And so they were angry, they were envious that the people listened to him, that the people flocked around him. They could have, listen, they could have just tried her in their own courts. Right? They could have gone to the Sanhedrin, could have conducted a trial, put her to death, and never have involved Jesus at all. That's not what they do. They had another agenda here. Being wise in their wickedness, they seized upon the opportunity to present Jesus with what they thought was a hopeless dilemma for him. Here's the dilemma. If he actually takes side with the woman against the Pharisees and spared her, then he would violate the law of Moses. What does the law of Moses clearly say? You have to put her to death, both her and the man. But in doing that, he would effectively abort his claim to be the Messiah. If he violates the law of God, he's not the Messiah, okay? The scribes and Pharisees were just standing around waiting. They were just anticipate waiting for some kind of word to come out of his mouth that would violate the law of Moses. But the Lord Jesus Christ cannot set aside the law of God or the justice of God. The Lord Jesus Christ being holy, God is holy. God is just. The Bible says that God will by no means acquit the wicked. Proverbs 17 verse 15 says this, he who justifies the wicked is an abomination to God. So to justify her, so to speak, would violate the law of Moses. However, if he upheld the law, if he upheld the law and called for the woman to be stoned to death, then he would be siding with the Pharisees in condemning the woman and his reputation for compassion. A friend of sinners would be destroyed in the eyes of the people. Right? How many sinners? How many sinners would come pleading to Christ if all they were to receive from him was justice and judgment, condemnation for their sin? How many women would weep at his feet, wiping his feet, washing his feet with the hair of their head if all she was going to get was condemnation and hellfire? Would you? (laughs) You remember, don't you? When you first became wrecked with conviction over your sin and went weeping and mourning before the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, for forgiveness. If you're a Christian, you remember a point, a period of time where you, you came to understand your depraved condition. You mourned over him whom they pierced. As one mourns over a son, you saw your state before the Lord and you came pleading for mercy, pleading for forgiveness, pleading for grace because you knew you needed it. This very dilemma raises a question that all sinners should long to have answered, doesn't it? How can sinful man be right with a holy God? How is it that God can be both just and the justifier of sinners? How is it that justice, God's justice, perfect justice, can be harmonized with mercy? Doesn't doesn't grace undermine 
justice? Doesn't grace undermine mercy? Doesn't grace sacrifice God's holiness? God's law demands justice. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 says, the soul who sins shall die. That's justice according to God's law. All under the law are cursed by the law to death. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10. For as many as are of works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Romans chapter 4 verse 15 says that the law of God brings about his holy wrath. How then does God forgive sinners like me and you without setting aside or violating his holy law? The the Lord's response here is amazing. Verse 6, it says that Jesus stooped down and he wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Now there are a lot of speculations here about uh, what he wrote. A lot of people try to explain. Some people quote Jeremiah chapter 17 that says that those who go astray, their names are written in the earth. So maybe he was writing their names, writing the names of those Pharisees in the earth with his finger. Uh, Some uh, say that he may have been writing their sins in the dust, in his verdict against them. No matter what is said, it is all speculation, right? We can't know for sure. But one thing that appears to make most sense to me is he was just waiting for a few moments. He's delaying for a few moments. They come rushing in, belligerent and hostile, with their plans already set, interrupting his teaching, and Jesus is just going to give them a moment to cool their jets a bit because what he's about to say to them, he wants it to sink in. He wants the, the appropriate response. If he answers them before cooler minds may prevail, this may not go well. They need to be rational and they need to be thoughtful about what he's about to say. And the Lord, we know for sure, has perfect timing. He is the master of the moment, and so he's just going to wait for a moment. And so in verse 7, then, we see in the Lord's response, his indictment of them. Look at verse 7. When they continued asking him, it says there they persisted. It's in the imperfect. They kept asking, kept asking. So finally, he raised himself up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And he again stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience... They went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. I can imagine, right, the scene, that's all it is, it's just an imagining, of Jesus very calmly, simply standing up in the midst of their hostility, in the midst of their belligerent and obsessive anger with him, seeking to entrap him, dragging this woman in to the midst. That Jesus waited for a moment, I'm sure with a righteous indignation in his heart over uh, what they were doing, what they were plotting, and he very calmly, in contrast to their haste, in contrast to their hostility, Jesus simply stood up, basically said, all right, you hypocrites with the law, he was without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first, and then he said nothing else. And he stooped back down. It's simple, right? Profound. A great economy of words here. Infinitely wise. They put him in this dilemma. I just, I, I, these are precious stories, right? Precious accounts of the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ in in confronting wickedness like this. Just the brilliance of it. In the economy of words, infinitely wise, Jesus upheld the law because he did not deny the woman's guilt. And he brought the law of God to bear on the consciences of those wicked Pharisees. And Jesus didn't oppose the law of God. He didn't oppose the law of God. He opposed those wicked and abusive scribes and Pharisees who perverted it. The law in Deuteronomy chapter 17, 7, also demanded that the witnesses of the crime were to be the first to throw stones at the guilty. You would raise, the witnesses would raise their hand in the stone first and then the people. However, in order to do that, they themselves had to be innocent of having anything to do with the crime. Now, just like those temple guards who came into the temple complex to seize them and they couldn't, these men, confronted by Christ, 
indicted by their own sin, simply could not do what they had come in intending to do. They were hostile. They were unrepentant. And maybe for a moment, maybe for a moment, they saw their hypocrisy. They saw in the Lord's response what they were about to do, what they were plotting. Maybe they knew they were guilty of adultery themselves, whether a physical act or even in the heart, right? Matthew chapter 5. If you look at someone with lust on your heart, you've committed adultery already with them in your heart. Bottom line, bottom line, they were wicked judges and they were unfit to judge her or to judge Christ or to judge the people. So to be clear here, the Lord in his response, not setting up a standard by which jurors must be sinlessly perfect in order to dole out justice or to judge righteously. Otherwise, no one could sit on a jury. We'd have no justice, right? Because everyone sins. The Lord here, again, is rebuking hypocritical judgment. Listen to this from Calvin. Christ is not prohibiting sinners from doing their duty in correcting the sins of others, but by this word, he only reproves hypocrites who mildly flatter themselves and their vices but are excessively severe and even act the part of felons in censuring others. You get it? He's condemning those here. He's condemning those who ignore their own sin, and yet they want to judge and condemn others without mercy. So now, the question that they came in with, no longer for Jesus. It's been turned on their heads. The question is now for them. And one by one, from the oldest, right, the oldest would be, more experienced, have a little more wisdom. Youngest, most likely to be immature and host- uh, hot-headed, you know, <laughs> in their youth. So one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they left. Under indictment for their hypocrisy, under indictment for their, their lack of mercy, under indictment for what they were doing, their conscience bearing witness against them. So Jesus upheld the law. He indicted those wicked Pharisees. But there was something else that his response accomplished here. He showed great mercy to the woman in saving her life from being stoned to death for her sin. Look at verses 10 and 11, the mercy. We see here the mercy of God. Verse 10 says, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now Jesus, for the first time in this account, He stands up now, and he looks at and he addresses the woman. There's no sarcasm here. There's no gloating. Jesus just assures the woman that those who sought her life are no longer there, no longer accusing her. Where are your accusers, he said, as no one condemned you? The only word spoken by the woman in the entire account is no one, Lord. She doesn't say anything until this point. No one, Lord. The reality of this is affirmed by the Lord himself. He hands down his, his own sentence here. Not merely as a good teacher, not merely as a man who lived a good life, but he hands down a sentence for this woman as the only one perfect who has ever walked this earth, who has power on earth to forgive sins and set at liberty the captives. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Doesn't mean here that he approves of her adultery, Doesn't mean here that he simply ignores her sin. Quite the opposite, in fact, if you think about our context. Because in just six months from now, in a short amount of time, having lived a perfect, sinless life, having fulfilled all the just demands of God's law, his righteous law, in immeasurable love and in immeasurable grace, He would be her substitute in death. He would be her representative in death. He would bear the penalty for her sin of adultery, in fact, all of her sin, on himself, on the cross, and give his life for her. He would take in himself the punishment and wrath that she deserved so that that day she could be saved. And so that... God may be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? The law demands death for sin. and the grace and mercy of God, Jesus delivers for those who would turn from their sin and put their faith in him. 
Herman Ritterboss states this. He says, Jesus silences with a word or a gesture the curse of a law torn from its base and by reestablishing justice on the foundation of his grace. A justice on the foundation of his grace. Grace does not do away with the law. Grace does not oppose the law of God. Those things are not, they're not enemies, grace and law. They're close friends, close companions. Law and justice, kiss. Justice and mercy, kiss, so to speak. Christ does not do away with justice here, exactly the opposite. Turn with me quickly to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, think about this in light of this glorious truth. Look at verse 31. Here the Lord says, Paul says to the Romans, What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can accuse you? Who is it that condemns you? Is Satan in your ear? Who can be against us? Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The Lord Jesus Christ died to satisfy the demands of the law, died to propitiate or to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? Verse 33, it is God who justifies Who is he who condemns? Where are your accusers? Who is it that condemns you? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Look at these glorious promises from God, right? If you will but turn from your sin, put your faith in Christ, entrust yourself to him, These promises apply to you. Who can separate us, verse 35, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Jesus saved this woman. And what an astounding example, right? What an astounding encouragement for sinners to cast themselves upon Christ, to to throw themselves at his feet for mercy, Right to cling to the cross where he paid that penalty for those that would repent and believe the gospel. What an encouragement to abandon your life of sin and be saved. What an encouragement to go to Christ for forgiveness, for cleansing, for grace. He says to this woman in John chapter 7, John chapter 8, and to every sinner who is accused and condemned by the law, Where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. However, the grace of God in Christ does not then give us a license to continue in sin. The Lord doesn't approve of her sin. He doesn't approve of of her adultery, of the lifestyle. Christ saves us to be holy. He saves us to be holy. I can say, we, right, as a church together can say, If you're here today and you're lost, you're still living in your sin, I can say that for the name of Christ and for the sake of Christ, that we desire to see you saved to Christ. But if you are saved to Christ, you'll be saved to a Christ that will break the chains that bind you to your sin and will set you free to submit to the law of God for his glory to be holy. That's the Christ that we serve. That's the salvation that is offered. And we see that at the end of verse 11 with the call 
The call to discipleship, the call to the Christian life. Jesus said to her, verse 11, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. You know, today we see such a pervasive lawlessness among those that profess the name of Christ. Such a pervasive indifference, neglect of the Christian life. Such a pervasive antinomianism is what it's called, an easy believism. No interest for the things of God. Not laboring and striving to be diligent in serving the Lord. Jesus says, go and sin no more. That's when the law, that's when the war begins to rage, right? Go and sin no more. And that war for holiness that is the Christian life, that battle to be pleasing in his sight, that battle to forsake sin and the power of the spirit to mortify the deeds of the flesh and the power of the spirit, that's where that war begins. God's holy law, his standard comes. But listen, to the believer, that standard, that law is the Christian's delight. We delight, don't we, to do our duty. We delight to be well-pleasing to him. Romans chapter 6, verse 2 says, How shall we, who died to sin, live any longer in it? The Lord says, Go and sin no more. Look with me at Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We see the glorious promises of God, the indicatives of Scripture, so to speak, if you understand your Greek. But we also see... The imperatives of Christ and the Word of God were to live according to them. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. That is justification. That's praise God. The woman, this woman, has been justified freely by his grace. There is no one left there to condemn her, no one to accuse her. However, who are those who are justified? Those, verse 1, who do not walk, they don't live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In just a short amount of time, this woman who the Lord saved here will receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit by which she will live for the Lord. And the power of the Spirit will live in a way that pleases God, in a way that fulfills the law. Look at verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, what? Has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. Listen, so that, verse 4, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In what way there is the law fulfilled? In what sense is the law fulfilled? One sense is justification. The law was fulfilled by Christ, and that righteousness of Christ imputed to us. We are covered, clothed in the white robes of Christ's righteousness who fulfilled the law for us. But in what other sense is the law there fulfilled in us? We have the power by the Spirit of God, to obey it. And we're commanded to obey it. Listen, it's those who walk according to the Spirit. Look at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those are unbelievers, right? But those who live according to the Spirit, they have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. Those are believers. Verse 6, look at the contrast. For to be carnally minded is death. Those carnally minded are unbelievers. But to be spiritually minded, those are believers, is life and peace. What life is he talking about there? We have life at our justification, but this that he's speaking of here in verse 6 is sanctification life. It's spirit-given life in the life of a believer to live for him, to walk according to the spirit. Look at verse 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, these are unbelievers, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, he's setting up a contrast here between unbelievers and believers. Unbelievers don't and they can't subject themselves here to the law of God. What's the contrast? What's the implication? The believers can. The believers can. An unbeliever can't please God. What's the contrast? 
The contrast is that believers can. By the power of the Spirit, we can please God. We can walk in a way that is pleasing to Him. This doesn't mean we're going to obey it perfectly. We won't. But that's part of the joy and reassurance of justification. There is no more, any longer, any condemnation. We have an advocate With the Father, Christ the righteous. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No longer any condemnation. That doesn't mean, though, that we have no obligation to keep God's holy standard. Drop down to verse 12 there in Romans chapter 8. Therefore, brethren, we are what? Debtors. Therefore, brethren, we're under obligation to go and sin no more. We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Go and sin no more, right? In the power of the Spirit of God. For as many, verse 14, as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We can't do it in our own power. This is Holy Spirit power. This isn't only justification power. This is sanctification power. Amen? The woman in our text is soon going to receive the Holy Spirit, whereby God ensures that she will walk according to his statutes, that she'll go and sin no more. Right? What a glorious picture of our salvation. The completeness of it. It is the, it's the complete diamond in all of its facets. Nothing lacking. God will not fail to see to it that his people are saved to the uttermost. And this is how justice and mercy kiss. It's how God can be both just and the justifier of you. If you'll put your faith in him. If you'll trust him. If you'll entrust yourself to him. It's a glorious, great salvation. Let's not neglect it, amen? Amen. Let's pray. I want you to take a moment in silent prayer and just ask that the Lord would bless the truths of his word to your heart. Uh, Ask the Lord to help you in applying these truths to your heart and to live for him. Let's pray.